All right, Ignite 301, Seven Mountains. How many of you guys are familiar with that terminology, the Seven Mountains? Hope so. Jen is a little familiar. Nobody else is familiar. Okay, good. Well, then we can we can really hit this hard. When, and this is important. This is something that um, the Spirit of God is really breathing on. Just to give a little bit of testimony to open this up. For me, um, I started ministry as a pastor in Berkeley. And I was a recent graduate. I was only 20 two or 23 um, when I helped plant the church and um, I was working with all young adults who were my age and students um, at Berkeley and what we found is that as the students graduated um, they just wanted to stay in our prayer room. We planted as a house of prayer and as a church and the kids they just wanted to stay in our prayer room. They wanted to help out with ministry stuff. They had a real vision for the kingdom. They wanted to serve the Lord and put him first in their lives and I was like that's awesome but they didn't want to get jobs. <laughs> right? They didn't want to get jobs. And um, and I was like, well, I understand why. Yeah, I want to put the kingdom first. And, um, you know, a lot of them weren't getting jobs. And they were just kind of staying around. And something just seemed kind of alarming in my spirit. Like, something is wrong here. Right? There's something wrong. So I really started to pray about this. I really started to pray. Be like, Lord, what what's wrong here? And I feel like the Lord started to speak to me about how I was giving them a vision, not for the kingdom, but for the church. I was giving them a church vision, not a kingdom vision. And God started to speak to me about how the kingdom was larger than the church, right? And really, the heart is that we are to bring the kingdom of God into the world, right? So God started to speak to me about all this kind of stuff, and I was just praying about this. And I felt like the Lord said, you're the one, you're the problem, Dennis, right? It's your fault, right? And, um, and I'm hearing about all this, and I, um, a door opens up for me. I go to Korea um, to, to minister at a retreat over in Korea, and I'm with this pastor over in Korea, and I'm sharing with him about kind of what my, you know, what I feel like God's been speaking to me about. He's like, oh, yeah, so you're talking about Seven Mountain stuff, right? And I was like, what's that? <laughs> right? And um, he starts to tell me the story about the Seven Mountains, and as he's speaking to me, I'm like, this is exactly what God has been speaking to me about. It's exactly what he's been speaking to me about. So I start to um, research like crazy um, into this thing called the Seven Mountains, and it just confirms everything the Lord had been speaking to me. So that's kind of my personal testimony um, about this. And uh, But as we dig in, I'll give you some more anecdotes kind of from my life and how I've applied this, okay? All right. So, number one, escaping versus invading earth. Okay, paragraph A. Most Christians are taught to believe in Jesus so that they can go to heaven. This creates an escapist mentality rather than an invading one. Scripture actually emphasizes that God and his kingdom are coming to earth, not that we are going to heaven. Okay, so let's look at what the Bible, I, I've included four passages of scripture because that's not obvious to many Christians these days, okay? Daniel chapter 2, Daniel sees this vision, and if you're familiar with this passage, he sees a statue, okay? And the statue has like a gold head and silver shoulders, and it goes down to different metals, and the interpretation is that, um, oh, excuse me, and then a rock comes and hits the statue, right, and it fills up the whole earth. And the Lord gives him an interpretation, and these, um, this statue are all these different kingdoms, Right, it's the Babylonian kingdom, and then the um, the Persian kingdom, and then what happens is this rock hits it, and in Daniel two thirty one it says this: but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. In the time of those kings, in verse forty four it says this: the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Okay, but it will itself endure forever, and that's exactly what's happened. Okay, so the in that vision, the um, the feet were a mix of clay and um, iron, I believe, and it is symbolic of the Roman Empire. And during the times of the Roman Empire, Jesus came into the world, right? And when he came into the world, he established his kingdom on the earth. And since then, his kingdom has been growing throughout the earth. And the prophecy in Daniel is that the kingdom is going to grow. It's going to expand. It's going to become the entire earth, right? That's what the Bible says, okay? The Bible says that this kingdom that we call Christianity is going to spread throughout the earth and it's going to take over the whole earth, okay? Isaiah 11, 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Think about that. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. In some translations, it says devotion to the Lord. Right? The earth will be filled with devotion to the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How, like the waters cover the sea pretty well, huh? 
Like it's literally like the same thing, <laughs> right? C is waters. All right, Micah 4 says, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. Okay, so this is speaking of a day when there will be no more war. War will be eradicated on the earth. It will be gone. Okay. In Matthew 16, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Okay. And again, that prophecy um, that Jesus gives him there, the gates of Hades are gates, it's speaking of, of defensive fortifications right? The gates like of a castle, right? The gates of Hades shall not overcome the church. That's not saying that, you know, it's not like the enemy's walking around with gates beating the church down, right? The idea is that the church won't fail to destroy the enemy's gates. Does that make sense? Okay. So really the prophecies are all offensive. Okay. The church is going to take over the world, not this idea that the world is going to take over the church. Okay. But a lot of that theology has really um, become popular in Christian you know, evangelical society. And I understand why, because there are scriptures that warn that in the last days the love of many will grow cold. Okay? There are scriptures that warn that there will be a great falling away and things like that. But really, I think the best way to understand it is that that is a temporary thing. There is a sense in which um, you know, the church will be beaten down, but the purpose of this is to give us courage and strength in that time because we're about to overcome. Does this make sense? Okay, so, you know, we don't know exactly how this is going to fill out, but there's probably going to be a great antichrist kingdom at the end of the age. Okay? A great antichrist kingdom that speaks of a counterfeit Messiah. Antichrist means counterfeit Messiah. So it's a counterfeit Christianity. Okay? Can I, you know, we haven't done this. I need to add this to Ignite, but we need to do a whole um, class on Islam. Okay? I am fairly certain that the counterfeit kingdom, the great antichrist kingdom at the end of the age is Islam. Okay, Islam is in many ways a counterfeit Christianity. Okay, so it seems likely that Islam will have a time, a short amount of time. Now, you know, many biblical scholars would argue that this is a period of like three and a half years. Okay, for three and a half years, you know, this Antichrist kingdom will be given power over the saints. Okay, and they'll oppress us and we'll go through great tribulation. Okay, but three and a half years is not a long time. That's just a short amount of time. Okay to give us strength, the prophecies are given to us so that we'll have hope, right, that that time will end and then great deliverance will come. Does this make sense? Okay, so we should not have the mentality that, that everything's gonna get worse and worse and worse and it's just gonna be terrible. So paragraph B, it says this, the popular paradigm is that the world and the church will gradually get worse and worse until Jesus returns to rescue us, which is the rapture, right? And this makes believers think that it is impossible to change the world for the better. So all we can do is hang on until the end, the biblical truth, however, is that both good and evil increase until the end of the age. Okay, And the, the parable that exemplifies this is the parable of the tares, the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13. And if you know the story, it's, um, you know, Jesus tells a story about a farmer who plants a good field. And in the night, an enemy comes and sows um, weeds or tares in the field. And the next day, they go, oh my gosh, what's, what's going on? There's all these weeds in the field. Should we go and root them out? And the, the farmer goes, no, don't root them out because then you might pull out some of the good wheat. Wait until the harvest, okay, and then they'll go in and they'll separate the wheat from the tares. Now, this speaks about the end of the age, okay? And what it, this, the idea is that God's plantings are maturing in the earth. Who, who are God's plantings? That's us, the church. The church is maturing in the earth, okay? And the plantings of the enemy are also maturing in the earth, okay? They're both going to mature. Good and evil are both maturing until the end of the age. Okay? And I think that history bears this out. What we saw in the 20th century is that some of the greatest good ever was done. Right? We've had the greatest prosperity, the greatest peace, the greatest education, all those kind of things, but we also had the greatest atrocities ever in all time. Right? We had World War II, we had the Holocaust, we had um, you know, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution in China where 20 million were killed, we had all sorts of ridiculous things happening in the 20th century together. Okay? And scripture speaks about this specifically in Romans chapter 8. It talks about the earth going through birth pangs. right? And the idea is that the earth is going to go through tribulations, birth pangs, that are going to get greater and greater and greater until the baby is born. Okay, The baby is the fullness of the kingdom. Jesus' return. 
Okay, so we can expect that times are going to get more intense. World War One, World War Two, which I really see as one birth pang together, um, it's going to get the next one's going to be worse. Okay, and that's why we as Christians we should not become deluded with this popular delusion. There is a popular delusion today that everything's just going to get better and better and better. No problem, no problem. Let's just give the government more power, right? More of our money because we've evolved past all that, you know old war stuff, and now everything's good. I want to say this is such an insane delusion, okay? This is such an insane delusion, right? Throughout history, the greatest oppressors on the planet have always been human governments, okay? That's why they're described as beasts in Scripture, okay? They're described as beasts in Scriptures. They're represented by beasts because power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is something that our founding fathers believed. That's why they did everything they could to create a government that was weak, that would be weak, that would not be able to oppress all the people, okay? And in our, in our generation, we're trying as hard as we can to tear that down, right? People like Bernie Sanders, God bless him, all right? He's doing everything he can to tear that down. Now, we'll talk about that in, when we get to our politics session, okay? But this is important that we understand these things. Paragraph C. In fact... The church will be mature and powerful when Jesus returns. Okay, here's what we have to understand. Evil is maturing in the earth, but the plantings of the Lord are also maturing, and that's us. Ephesians 4 says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. Pause. Think about that. Until we all reach unity. That is crazy, Right? This problem is that we're going to be totally united okay? until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Listen to what he's saying right there. We're going to, be, we're going to come into full maturity is what Paul is prophesying here. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. That is crazy to me. Right? He's saying we're going to be just as mature as our head, who is Christ. I don't even understand how that's possible, but that's what it says. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Okay, So Paul's essential argument is this. God has given the fivefold ministers, okay, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, to equip the, his people for the work of service to build up the church until we get fully mature. Okay, so I think this is a great scripture to say those who teach that there are no more modern day apostles and prophets, I think this scripture would have a bone to pick with them. Okay, because it says this Christ gave himself these fivefold ministers to get us to complete maturity. We need them until complete maturity comes. Does this make sense? Okay, now some of that is review because I incorporated some of that into um, our first lesson, right? So hopefully those are not brand new concepts for you. Any questions, comments, thoughts on this first section here? Cool. All right. Section two, what is the gospel? Preface. God had promised the Jewish people that he would one day give them a king who would rule over the entire earth and establish worldwide peace under his rule forever. When Jesus came, he preached the good news that that kingdom had now come. God's plan was not only to bring peace on earth, but to restore the whole creation from its corruption. This is the gospel of the kingdom that God would establish his perfect rule on the earth. To do that, he had to deal with the core issues of sin and the sinful nature of humanity, which he did through the substitutionary death of Christ. Now, we often focus on the gospel of salvation, the truth that individuals can be saved into his eternal kingdom and family by accepting through repentance and faith the atoning death and lordship of Jesus. That is a lot of theological words, okay? I am assuming that you are somewhat familiar with this idea, okay? This is what is taught in, you know, the vast majority of churches everywhere. So I am assuming that you're fairly familiar with this, which is why I packed so many tough theological words into, like, one or two sentences there, okay? If you need me to break that down, please let me know, and I can break that down um, more simply. Okay, now, that's true, okay? The gospel of salvation is true. If you believe in Jesus, you will be saved and go to heaven forever. That is true, but that's really not the center of what the Bible calls the gospel, 
Okay, and we talked about this in our first section also. So some of this is review. Okay, the gospel is this, that Jesus has been given authority over all the heavens and the earth. And he's going to bring full restoration to all of it. Okay, that's a beautiful thing. Okay, that, let me, that's the dream of everyone on the earth. That's the dream of everyone on the earth. The socialist dream, okay, is a perversion of that dream. The socialist dream is that we as humans can make a government that is perfectly good and shares, makes everybody share everything, and we can have utopia on the earth. That's the socialist dream, and that's why it's so compelling, especially to young kids, because they're dumb. God bless us, all right? Yeah, we'll just share everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, okay? But that's the socialist dream. The Islamic dream is similar. Okay, the Islamic dream is God is going to send a Mahdi who is like an end time Messiah type figure who's going to lead all Muslims to conquer the earth and establish Sharia law, which is the, the you know God's law, the perfect law, and we're going to have peace on the earth under Sharia. This is the Islamic dream. Okay, every compelling worldview has the same dream because they're all antichrists. They're all counterfeits of the biblical dream. Does this make sense? And it speaks to our hearts because God has designed us to long for these things. That's why if you, you know, th there's that old trope, right? If you get a wish, what do you ask for? World peace, <laughs> right? I want world peace. Well, why is it that we all kind of understand that dream? We want world peace because it's been, it's been written in our hearts. That's the design. That's the plan of God from the very beginning, right? Was to restore the earth. That's why he's the prince of peace. That, that term, shalom, in Hebrew is a very loaded term, right? We just think of it as like, oh, peace. But the Hebrew connotations of that word shalom are very far-reaching. You no, know, it's like an established, it's like a perfect peace. It's a peace that brings harmony and perfection to everything. Does that make sense? And that's really the sense in which the scripture is talking about these things, okay? All right, now we have a paradigm to get the seven mountains, okay? Seven mountains, paragraph A. Seven Mountain Mandate is a corrective prophetic word to redirect the church to have an invading mentality rather than escapist one and disciple culture in addition to discipling individuals. Okay, so here is the story. In 1974, Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham had a similar dream. Okay, now let me clarify who these guys are. Bill Bright is the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. Today they're called Crew on many college campuses. Okay, I believe they're the largest Protestant missions organization in the world. Okay. Lauren Cunningham is the founder of Youth with a Mission, YWAM. They are the, se the second largest Protestant missions organization in the world. Okay, So God gave the same dream, essentially, to the two greatest missions leaders in the world at the time. And both of them saw seven mountains or seven spheres of cultural influence. And on these mountains were written names. One was religion government, media, entertainment, education, family, and business. And the Lord told them that to effectively disciple the nation, they would have to rule on all of these seven mountains. And what, you know, I, I didn't include this, but, oh, no, I did. The church is trying to accomplish its mission through the organization of the church, the religion mountain. Now, members are taught and expected to attend church, to serve at church, to bring friends to church, and to tithe to the church. Okay, and what do we do? We give people a church-based vision. And I've already confessed to you, this, I was totally guilty of this. Okay, I was totally guilty of this. And that's because I was raised in a Korean church, right? Which is a fairly standard evangelical type of church. And what we tend to do is preach a church-based vision. Okay, how do you serve the kingdom of God? By volunteering at your church a lot, right? By basically living at the church. That's how you serve the kingdom of God. Does this make sense? But can I say that is really not what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom of God, if we're really living in it, should bring us outside of the church. It should be us bringing the kingdom into the world. That's really what this is about, okay? That's our calling, to disciple nations. And this is the part that the church has not understood. Because of that, what we've done is we've actually backed away from the nation. We've actually said, hey, what we're going to do is we're just going to hide in our prayer closets and not let the world touch us right? Oh, secular music, stay away, <laughs> right? Secular TV shows, stay away, right? And we're just going to hide, and we're just going to pray, and you know, what about trying to change culture? Well, if God wants to change it, he'll do it, right? With this very fatalistic attitude, he'll do it, right? 
And I want to say that is not what we're taught in Scripture. That is not the example that's given to us, okay? All the figures in Scripture that are given to us contend with their cultures, okay? They're fighting with their cultures, and they're making enemies, right? That's why Scripture says that in this life, you will have trouble. You'll have persecution, right? Blessed are you when you're persecuted. That's why every major Christian leader in the Scriptures was persecuted because they were contending, they were fighting with their cultures, but we've now embraced a mentality of Christianity where we're to be as inoffensive as possible. You'll notice I don't follow that example, okay? I have no problem being controversial. I think that's the job of the church. That's what it means to be the light of the world. To be the light of the world means that you're speaking to truth into areas of controversy. Why? Because in areas of controversy, there's darkness. It's not clear what's right or what's wrong. Now, if I'm wrong, then I'm just more darkness, <laughs> right? And the Lord will judge us all on that day. But if I'm right, then I'm being the light of the world. I'm doing what I'm calling. And that's the, that's the model that you see of all the biblical leaders, okay? All of them spoke into very controversial things. All of them contended with people who were offended at what they were trying to do, okay? I was just reading, you know, Romans yesterday about how... Um, you know, the divine attributes of God are apparent through the creation, but the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and against the wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, right? That's the idea. There's many people in our culture today who are actively fighting to suppress the truth. Those people should be offended with us, and they are. <laughs> They hate evangelical Christians, right? Those people are offended with us because they're trying to suppress the truth and we're coming against them. We're saying, no, this is the truth and they hate us for it. That's a good thing. We should get hated for it. That means we're doing something right, okay? So I think that that aspect's really important. We'll get into more of that in a little bit, but I want to give us this understanding, this sense. Our job is to do the work of ministry out in the world, not just in the church, okay? Let's do it in the church, but that's not how we change culture. The way we change culture is by getting out of the church into the world. And by the way, that's how every single Christian has calling on their life. Okay? In the old understanding, where we're trying to do everything in the church mountain, what it means to be called is to become a pastor. But that's not right. Does this make sense? No, no, no. We don't need everyone to be pastors. That would be terrible. Okay? I always tell people, don't be a pastor, okay? Unless the Lord tells you and commands you to do it, then obviously be a pastor, okay? But otherwise, what we need is we need faith-filled, dynamic, powerful Christians to be shining lights in the world. That's what we need in this generation. And that's a calling that all of us can have, okay? All right, secular humanism. My favorite topic. Oh, excuse me, I skipped a paragraph. The purpose of the church organization is to empower Christians to minister effectively. Ephesians 4 talks about ministers equipping saints. That's the passage we just read earlier. With their respective anointing so that all are contributing in meaningful ways. What the body really needs is for Christians to be influential outside of the church organization. Okay? This is why I say every Christian has calling. Every Christian has a gift. Okay? Not just a gift. I think gifts. And if you ask God, he can give you more gifts. Okay, I was just sharing with Long Beach House Church this week about how the parable of the talents, right? God gives five talents to someone, and he multiplies it, and now he's got ten. And God gives two talents to another person. He multiplies it, and he gets two. And then God gives one talent to the person, and what does he do? He hides it in the ground because he's afraid. It's like, I knew you were a hard man, right? So I, I just kept it. Here's, here's your talent back, right? And what does God do? He says, you wicked and lazy servant. This is speaking of many Christians, okay? This is not speaking of unbelievers. It's speaking of many Christians, you wicked and lazy servant, right? You did not steward what I gave you correctly. And what do, what do I mean by that? I'm saying, let me just say, put it this way. If you don't know how you're gifted, you are not stewarding your gifts correctly. Okay? I don't say that to condemn you. I say that to convict you of immaturity. Okay? If we're convicted of immaturity, then we have grace to grow. If we're just like, if we're, if we're like, oh, yeah, I don't know how I'm gifted, but most people don't have their gifted, so it's okay. No, 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 that's because you're a bunch, uh, among a bunch of immature people, okay? You have to have an 
you have to have a view that you are living amongst a, a bunch of immature people, so you have to break out and be different from those that are around you. You can't be content being just like every other Christian. Why? Because every other Christian today is losing the nation. We are losing the nation today. We should be alarmed. We should be like, oh my gosh, what are we doing wrong? Instead, what we're doing is we're trying to teach all the rest of the world about our brand of great evangelical Christianity. You know what I think? I think all the other churches in the world are looking at our church and be like, who the heck do you think you guys are? You guys are losing your nation. You're trying to teach us? How about you get some passion and some power and some prayer, and then you can try and teach us what you know, right? But this idea, because we have lots of knowledge, have lots of biblical knowledge, I'll tell you what we have. We have lots of biblical theories, which are garbage without the power that actually sets people free and shifts culture. Does this make sense? Don't fall into this religious spirit. Look, this is what happens, okay? People go to seminary, and they're like, oh my gosh, there's so much biblical knowledge, right? These professors are so smart. They know so much stuff, okay? But can I tell you, it does not matter how much you know up here. It matters how much God has put in here that has turned into an, effect, an ability to influence and affect people and shift other people. Does that make sense? Okay. Daniel saw this in Daniel chapter 12. He saw multitudes rising from the dead. Those, the righteous, went on to glory and the wicked were punished. And then he saw those who were like stars shining in the skies. Those were those who had brought many to righteousness. Understand this, church. It is our calling to bring many to righteousness. All of us, all of us as individuals have a calling to bring many to righteousness. The only thing that gets in our way is our own lack of faith. It's our lack of faith. Why? Because God says you can have anything that you ask for in prayer. Is that real? Is he joking? <laughs> yeah, God, but you gifted that guy and you didn't gift me. And God's like, no, excuse me. I gifted you. And if you want, I'll gift you more if you ask me. This is why I'm really trying to speak against this false modesty. Okay, false modesty kills us. False modesty is not humility. It is a lack of faith. False modesty is not humility. It is a lack of faith. No, you can have whatever you ask for in prayer. If you contend and you seek for it, I promise you, God will either give it to you or will give you something like it that's just as glorious. So there are no excuses for powerlessness. There are no excuses for powerlessness. The only excuse is, I have been immature at God. Help me to become mature. Okay? And look, I'm not, I'm not saying this to condemn you. I feel like I'm in the same boat. I feel like, I, God, I've got to become far more powerful than I am. And hear me, this is not so that, you know, people will look at me and go, oh, Dennis is so cool, <laughs> right? I don't care about that, right? I care that on the day of judgment, I do not want to be shocked by God's standards. That is the, that's the worst nightmare every Christian should be afraid of, that they get there on the day of judgment, and God starts to reveal his standards for judgment. And, you, and I'm like, oh, I had no idea you were going to judge like that. That, is the, that's, that should be our biggest fear. Right? What should happen on the day of judgment? We should go, I knew you were going to say that. I knew it, right? I knew it, right? That's good because that gives us grace to live the kind of life that God has called us to live. Don't bury your head in the sand. No, this is why I'm also speaking out a lot these days on the fear of the Lord. Okay? Fear of the Lord is to, is to rightly appreciate his warnings. Okay? His warnings give us power for holiness. Okay, I'm going a little off topic here. But I'm saying this because this is why I, I push you guys seriously. I push you guys seriously because I expect you to be great. I expect you to be great. I do not expect that you just be a lukewarm Christian. If you're a lukewarm Christian, I will try to literally scare the hell out of you. Because I think that's what I'm supposed to do. Does this make sense? No lukewarmness. Lukewarmness, you're probably gonna, on your way to hell. That, that's what the scripture says, okay? Lukewarmness, you're probably on the way to hell. Those of you guys who are teachers in youth group, I guess it's just Kate. <laughs> you're in, in the education department. I don't think anybody else is a teacher here, huh? Well, then Kate, 
And all of you guys who this is, because this qualifies you to be um, staff member at another department if you want to be, okay? I want to say this. You need to scare the heck out of these junior high, high school kids, okay? Scare the heck out of them. And why? Why? Because God's standards should scare us if we're living in lukewarmness. That's what gives us grace to come out of lukewarmness. Does that make sense? Right? If we're like, no, he loves me. I'm all good. Like he's proud of me in my lukewarmness and he'll never let me go. Right? That, that type of stuff is taught all the time. No, no, no. Let me say this. If you're putting the kingdom first and you stumble often because of your immaturity, but you're really trying to put God first, well, then you receive grace and mercy from God, right? I try and preach grace and mercy to everybody that I see that's trying to put the kingdom first. They're trying to follow God with all their heart, but they stumble into sin, right? They make mistakes. They do stupid things, right? We just give grace and mercy for them. But for people who have decided, eh, I'm good. I'm like, no, you're not. No, you're not, right? No, Scripture warns people like you, right? It warns you. Don't be a fool. Don't be the hard, rocky soil that never gets deep roots in the kingdom. Don't be the thorny soil that never surrenders the idol of money or career. Does this make sense? Brothers and sisters, this is why we're having you do this class, and this class is just the beginning. Here's what I say. You must apply yourself to Scripture study. You must... Memorize many passages of scripture, not because it's an obligation, but because you love the word of God. That's the heart, right? Loving the scriptures. And that takes time. And it's hard. And it's hard on purpose because it's the greatest reward in eternity. It comes to those who love the scriptures and who practice them. Right? Okay. Secular humanism. By now, you guys should under no secular humanism. I realize I'm repeating myself a lot in this section. God bless us. Secular humanism is the primary enemy of the church in the Western world. It rejects the truth that man is a created being and therefore rejects sin, absolute right and wrong, and the truth about the sinful nature. Humanists have assumed the primary places of influence in American culture. In entertainment, media, education, and politics, humanist culture reigns. Because of this, the great influence the Lord gave to America because of its previously Christian orientation, is now being used to export humanism all over the world. Let me put it to you like this, okay? After World War II, America really took ownership of South Korea, and the communists took ownership of North Korea after World War II. The Japanese um, controlled the Korean Peninsula, and they were driven out in World War II, okay? America took the southern half, and... Um, you know, communist China and Russia took the, took the top half, North Korea. What you saw was that in really two generations, Korea went from one of the poorest nations in the world to one of the richest nations in the world. South Korea did. Okay. North Korea went from one of the poorest nations in the world to literally almost the most controlled, most poor, most terrible nation in the entire earth. Right? What you saw was that Koreans learned right, from their discipler nations. That's what happened. Two generations. Now what's happened? I just heard like the most ridiculous statistic. I forgot the, the it's something like some ridiculous, it's like 10% of Christians or 5% of the nation now, this upcoming generation, young people in Korea are now Christian, right? They're apostatizing at a faster rate than America. Why? Because they have no depth. They have no root, okay? They received great blessing because they just copied us. Now that's blessing, right? That's like a kid, right? You just copy your dad and you get blessed if your dad does wise things. But they never developed the root. They didn't have to go through the national struggles to get that deep wisdom. So what's happening is in, in one generation, boom, they lost their priority for prayer. Now, boom, the whole nation is turning away from God. And what's going to happen? They're going to lose all of their wealth. That's what happens. God blesses a nation for righteousness. A nation is exalted by its righteousness is what scripture says. World War I and World War II, I went over this on the first day. It really should be understood. That was a judgment on Europe. God was removing the power and the wealth from Europe because of their rebellion against him. And the same thing is going to happen to America if we continue on the trajectory that we're on. And the same thing is going to happen to Korea. All the wealth that God has given them is going to be, is going to be used up. It's going to be destroyed 
because they listen to the humanists. God bless them. America, Americans are raised under such strong humanist influence that without strong church integration, they seriously struggle to believe in God, which Romans 1 says is obvious to all. This is only possible because the church has not understood its calling to influence culture or the nature of its spiritual battle against humanism and Islam. Okay, here's the problem, okay? Now, there's a lot, well, there's a lot of different problems, so I'm just going to go on for a little bit, okay? Our strategy in America for how do we make the, make the, the nation Christian, this is our strategy, okay? We're going to get people, Christians, to go out, you know, two by two and, to ha and try and convince somebody in a five-minute conversation, right, to become Christian in five minutes. This is what we call contact evangelism. Now, I'm not trying to say that contact evangelism has no value. I'm just saying that it by itself cannot do this, okay? It by itself cannot do this. Let, I, let, me, let me put it to you in the converse. How many of you guys have been approached by those roving bands of atheist evangelists who are trying to evangelize to you? None of you have. Nobody has ever done that, right? Why? Because that's not how they work. That's not how they focus their efforts. What have they done instead? They've taken the positions of influence and power in our society and they're influencing everybody through those positions of influence. As Christians, we have to understand it's our job to fight for those positions of influence. And we surrendered them in foolishness, thinking that they didn't matter. And a lot of this, look, if I could be blunt, a lot of this is because we had a sense of like this misunderstanding of the sovereignty of God. Well, you know, God's sovereign. He's going to do whatever, he's gonna, whatever he wants to do. I think that's such a terrible mentality, right? No, God holds us responsible for the sin of our neighbor to some degree. Okay? This is what you see in Scripture. Nations share in judgment because in the economy of God, you have the ability to influence your neighbor. Does this make sense? All of us have the ability to influence our neighbor. That's why if our nation is apostatizing, God holds the church accountable because we are the conscience of the nation. We're the one who's supposed to be influencing the nation with righteousness. But when we become silent and we keep our voices to ourselves, then what happens? The nation goes into unrighteousness without a conscious speaking to it. You know what you want? Every time you're getting tempted to sin, you want a voice to pop in your head. Don't you do it, you stupid. <laughs> right? Don't you even think about it, right? You want your voice of conscience to pop up and say you have a destiny on your life, right? You want your voice of conscience to pop up and start to declare to you the truth in those moments of temptation. So what happens if that voice doesn't pop up? If all you hear is the voice of temptation constantly, day and night, all the time, you know what happens? You fall into temptation. That's literally the story of our nation, especially over the past 50 years. The voice of the church has been squelched because of our confusion and our cowardice. And that's what I'm trying to say. It is time to fight for our nation. Our mission. Paragraph A. We must retake the positions of influence in our culture. This will not be easy as they have become humanist strongholds. We need bold Christian professors, reporters, filmmakers, etc., who can discern humanism and actively fight against it. Okay? This section is, is on purpose. It's a little short because I want us to have some talk, some time to talk. When are we supposed to end this section? In 30 minutes, huh? In 15 minutes. It's 9, 16 right now. Well, let's discuss as long as we can. Where is the strongest humanist influence in our culture? How can, you, how can you tell? Let me ask this. How can you tell where the strongest humanist influence in our culture is? How can you tell, though? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I have, a, I have a nice litmus test, okay? Here's the nice litmus test, okay? If you take the thing that is most offensive to a humanist and you shout it out in this place, where would you get the most hate? Okay. So, for example, I think these days, the biggest thing that you can say, right, that will really make people mad, if you say homosexuality is a sin against God, right, 
where, if you were to shout that out, where would you get the most hate? On social media, right? Yeah, for sure you'd get hate on social media. I get hate all the time on social media. But actually, most of the people that like usually send hate my way, they kind of gave up on me. I used to get way more hate, you know? Now, it's just, you know, every once in a while, someone will see something mean, but whatever. Yeah, where else? How about in your classrooms? That might be the center of it. Your classrooms might be ground zero, okay, of the, the strongest human, humanist, secular humanist stronghold in America. I think it's the university classroom on, on a California university. <laughs> Right, especially if you're like a socialism major, right, or a gender studies major, right, or ethnic studies, or one of these, you know, super hyper humanist, you know, um, study fields, right, you will get monstrously destroyed. Okay, but you're right in the media. If you go to the the, the news floor of the New York Times, right, and you say that, they will freaking crush you over there. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Okay. This is important for us to understand. Why? Because what ha what's happening now? Humanists have actually assumed all the positions of influence that affect kids. Okay, that affect kids. What we see is that our news media, our um, school system, our media, our um, arts and entertainment, movies, television shows, right, video games, music, all of these places that influence children have been strongly taken over by secular humanists. Okay. That's very strategic. That's on purpose. Okay. Why do we have this generation that's so enamored with now socialism? It's because they've been influenced at a very young age with these ideas. So yeah, why do I say such controversial things on social media? That's why. I'm determined. I don't care if I, I don't care. See, here's, here's what you don't understand. A lot of people tell me, Pastor Dennis, peop, people, they, they want you can't convince people like that, right? By just saying something, you know, that they'll get offended by in a public place. You can't convince people. That's not how you win people's hearts. And I'm like, why? Well, I, I kind of understand what you're saying. I kind of understand what you're saying. And when I'm talking individually with people, I'm not going to talk, like, say the most offensive thing I could to your face, right? That's not what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to treat you as an individual. I'm going to have a good conversation with you. But here's the thing. I'm not going to come under their standards for right and wrong. I'm going to impose my standards for right and wrong on them, right? Now, there's somebody who's strongly discipled in humanism, they'll look at me and they'll be like, dude, that guy's kind of crazy, right? That guy is 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 a crazy person. Like, these days, the most hate I get is when I speak out against systemic racism, Okay. Systemic racism is kind of like the, the golden goose of this whole thing. All right, we'll get there when we talk about politics. And when I speak out on that, that's where I get the most hate these days. Right? But I speak out strong on that stuff now. Why? Because it starts, it has to start with one person. Okay? If, you, if Jeremiah is crying out by himself, then people are like, dude, that, guy, that guy's weird. Right? That, guy, that guy's a weird prophet, one of those weird prophets. Right? But if people start to believe what he's saying and they start to come around him and they start to say, no, he's right, this is real, then what happens? It becomes a movement. That's the nature of how this works. Okay? has to start somewhere with people who have courage and then it, it can become a movement. But without the voices who are willing to be looked at as crazy people, then there's no hope for a movement. And that's why the prophets were always that prototypical figure of a person calling out in the wilderness. Right? John the Baptist, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. And what happened? He became a movement. He became a movement. People started to come to the wilderness to hear him because he was so different from what all the other leaders were saying around him. Does this make sense? And what was he doing? He was preparing the people to receive what Jesus was going to say. Because Jesus came and he said largely the same thing. And people were now prepared. Does that make sense? Okay. This is such a big deal. Okay, question D. Why are Christians intimidated? Why does the church have such little influence relative to its size? I mentioned the first day, we are roughly 20%, a little less than 20% of the nation, okay, are go to church about twice a month or more. 
That's incredible. 20% of the nation. Why don't we have the influence of the LGBT community, which is about 3% of the nation? Yeah. Yes. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. They're more passionate. That's a huge part of this. At the Tower of Babel, what happened? The Lord judged people. He said they'll be able to accomplish whatever they unify around. Right? So what did he do? He divided them so that they couldn't be united. Right? And it's the same way with passion. When churches are preaching different messages, right? You know, my greatest attackers are always former Christians. Former Christians are always the ones that are always attacking me like crazy, right? Former Christians or super liberal Christians, right? Because they're the heretics of our time, okay? Heretics of our day are progressive Christians, okay? And what I mean by that is those who teach that homosexuality is not a sin, who teach that abortion is not a sin, right? That these things are fine in the eyes of God. I, I think these people are the modern day heretics, okay? And they're always people that are the most angry and upset at me. Why? Because they're fighting for their own vision of what Christianity should be about. But frankly, it's a not a biblical standard of Christianity. And that's why the scriptures warn so much about heretics. Because they, what do they do? They sow confusion in the body. Now nobody knows, right? What's right? Well, Pastor Dennis says this, but that other Christian leader, he says the complete opposite. Who knows? And what does it do? It keeps the church in confusion and apathy when there's confusion. Does this make sense? Right? This is why I think that what's going to happen is we're going to start having a purging of the body. Judgment comes first to the house of the Lord. What does that mean? That means the branches that don't bear fruit are cut off the vine. That's actually what's been happening over the past 10 years. Okay? Many Christians, those who call themselves Christians, are no longer, no longer call themselves Christians. And that's a good thing. The church has to be purified so that there can be a clear voice calling out from the church that people can rally around, and then we, become, then we can become a movement. This is a problem. So much of the church has had a mentality, we just want to grow big. We just want lots of people. We want big churches. But what we've done is we've sh made the churches so, the message so shallow, right? We won't talk about anything that's, that's potentially controversial or offensive so that we can have as many people feel comfortable and inclusive and loved, right? But then what you do, you, be, you get a church that has no ability to speak into darkness, right? No ability to shift culture. The church follows the culture rather than being the ones to shift and move the culture. And I want to say that that is the story for, for most churches in America right now. And I, I want to say this in humility because they do other things really well. Okay, Lots of churches do really, a lot of good things, helping the poor, helping the homeless, right? Doing, a, you know, I don't know, fun events. <laughs> you know, like, there are lots of good stuff that's happening in those other churches. But I want to say when we sacrifice that prophetic mantle that we're supposed to be carrying, when we sacrifice the prophetic anointing, then what happens is we become a church that follows the culture rather than leads the culture. So I'm, I'm going to ask again, why are Christians so intimidated? Well, let me make it personal. Because I remember what it was like to be in college. Okay. Why, why, is, why are you intimidated? Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, we're intimidated. Okay? I remember I was in a discussion section at Berkeley where we were studying medieval writings, and they were talking about miracles because, you know, monks wrote all the history of, of Europe um, in the medieval period. They are talking about this miracle that they saw. And, you know, the class was basically assuming, okay, there was no real miracle here. So what do you think he really saw? In my mind, I was thinking, why do you just assume that there's no real miracle, right? Most of the world believes in the supernatural, right? The vast majority of people on the earth believe in supernatural things, whether it be ghosts or witch doctors or, you know, ancestor spirits or, you know, new age. Like, it's actually the majority of people. I would guess it's the vast majority of people, okay, believe in the supernatural. It's just that in our university, it's become so taboo to even suggest such a thing. And I remember I'm sitting there thinking, and I have a pretty solid point just sitting there in my mind, right? I'm like, whatever. You know, I don't need to cause a ruckus with these people, right, and make, and make myself look like an idiot, you know? I didn't see it at that time as something that would be beneficial at all, right? I just saw it as like, I'll just, whatever. I had no vision for changing my class. I didn't think that that was part of my job description, right? Now, when I got to grad school... In seminary, 
I was taking class on, I was sharing with some of you guys, on microaggressions. You guys know what a microaggression is? Okay. Microaggression is if you say, you know, oh, I'm so glad we have such amazing Orientals here today. <laughs> right? Like, this is an example of a microaggression, right? Because there's like a subtle implication that, oh, we didn't really expect you to come, but, you know, you're kind of the other but, you know, we're glad that you're something like that. That's a microaggression. Does that make sense? And what it does is the whole system of microaggressions has been embraced by the university system, and it puts the onus, the responsibility on the person speaking. So it's your job to be inoffensive, right? And I think that that is the completely opposite from the way the Bible frames it, right? I think the Bible puts the onus on the person hearing. It's the person hearing. It's his job not to be offended. Does that make sense? So we were talking about this in our, in our seminary class because it was a class on counseling and how we have to be sensitive and all this kind of stuff. We were studying microaggressions, and I, I just straight up told the professor, I think you're wrong on this, okay? I think this is unbiblical. I think this is wrong. And I, I, I said all the verses why I thought that this was a non-biblical mentality to have, right? And what it does is it makes us, it, it creates a hypersensitive, victimized culture when we embrace this. Right, because then what happens? Whenever somebody gets offended, you feel like you did something wrong. Right? No, the truth is, if somebody gets offended, they did something wrong. Right? Because people say offensive things to me all the time, and you know what my job is? To love them, to forgive them, brush it off, and love them as they are. That's my job as a Christian. Okay? And guess what? That's what they should be doing too. And what does that do? That enables me so I'm not worried about offending people anymore. Right? Obviously, I don't want to offend people, but when people get offended, right, I don't naturally jump to the, oh, shoot, I did something wrong. And you know what that does? That shuts down your voice, and you can't be a bold voice for truth anymore. So let me ask again, what, let me make it a little bit personal. Why is it that we, that I, am so easily offended, or excuse me, so easily intimidated, right, in my classroom, in my workplace, in my friendship group, whatever. What causes the church to be so silent? Yeah. Like you have the power to ruin their view of who God is and what the church is like. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. Let me ask you, have you seen an example of that where somebody has done something or said something and it ruined, you know, Christianity for somebody or something like that? Can you share a story like that? Sure. How many of you guys have seen something similar like that and felt something similar? Okay, a lot of people. Yeah, okay. I totally understand that. And I, I went through um, similar experiences um, when I was in college. I remember we had, you know, we had some people, you know, um, preaching about hell and, you know, stuff like that. And I felt like, dude, why are they doing that? They're totally giving the church a bad name, right? Um, what I would like to do, though, is, is, is share with you something that I've learned since then, okay? The person who says, oh, that's why I'm not a Christian because of those people, they're lying to you. That's not the truth, what they're saying. They're not a Christian um, not because somebody is telling them, you know, that they're going to go to hell or something like that, okay? They're, uh, they're, they reject that because they have been influenced to believe that that is an example of something that's really terrible. Does that make sense? They believe that that is a picture of, you know, the opposite of what love looks like. But let me suggest this. Biblically speaking, a lot of the apostles and Jesus himself said things that are somewhat similar to those people holding up those signs, okay? Now, I need to clarify here, because I'm not saying that we should speak out of offense and anger and hatred to the people that we're trying to correct, and stuff like that. But I am saying that it's very possible to give that same message of you're going to hell, okay, and you need to repent of your sins. It's very possible to give that message that's not from a place of personal offense, not from a place of anger, you can be speaking all truth, and yet many people would look at that and be like, that's why I'm not a Christian. I hate those guys. Right. And the problem is not that those people holding the signs are sinning or doing something wrong. They're not doing something wrong at all. They don't have to be doing something wrong, right? But what's happened is people have become so influenced by humanism that the message that's being shared 
is looks to them like the opposite of love. Does this make sense? Okay, this is important because what it shows is that we have come under that same influence. I've come under that same influence, right? Why? Because you grow up in America, and what's happened from a very young age, you start to learn you can't say anything negative to people, right? Don't say anything negative. If you say anything negative, you point out a flaw or you say something mean. Like, what's the worst thing that, you know, a kid can do these days? You're fat, right? Or something like that, right? Every, like, every adult's like, no, no, don't say that, right? Don't say that, right? What, what are we teaching kids? We're teaching them that to say something that's potentially offensive is like the most evil thing you can do, right? But I want to say that that is actually not a biblical standard. And because of that, it's made us into people who we don't know how to receive correction. I just mean, I'm talking about nationally. We don't know how to receive correction. Everything that sounds like correction seems like rejection and hatred to us. Right? But I want to say again, that's not the biblical standard. The biblical standard is that God disciplines us out of his love. It's his love that disciplines us. right? But that's why the discipline of God sounds like hatred to the world. It's not because there's something wrong with God or with his word or with his commands or with his judgments, but there's something wrong with our culture and how we have been trained to see those things as hatred. Does that make sense? Right? And that's what I mean. So if I went out on Sproul and I started to preach, hey guys, God loves you so much, right? But he is going to judge you and you must repent for abortion. Okay? If you have committed abortion, or you've told somebody else to get, to get an abortion, you're a murderer, you're an accomplice in murder in the eyes of God. And if you don't repent of this, okay, you're going to be judged. God will judge you. Now, if I were to say that, you know, on campus, there's a lot of people that'd be like, that's why I'm not a Christian, because of guys like that. But everything I just said there is perfectly, I believe, biblical, okay, and accurate and true. But the culture has been so conditioned to reject messages like that. Does this make sense? And this is part of the problem because we grew up in this culture. But everything I'm trying to do in this session is to help you see the effects of humanism. Right? The effects of humanism are really strong and they're invisible to us. We can't see them because we've adopted that mentality. And that's why when we hear people say things like, oh yeah, those hateful Christians, that's why I'm not a Christian, our immediate tendency is to be like, oh man, I hate those hateful Christians too. I wish they wouldn't do that, right? But you know the one who's really wrong in this situation? It's the one who judges God because they don't understand one of his messengers, right? They don't understand the words that are being said, so they naturally assume that God's wrong. You have to understand from God's perspective, he's gonna judge the one who rejects him for those reasons far more harshly than the one who preaches something that may sound offensive to people. Does that make sense? God's standards of judgment are different from that person, right? Does that make sense? That's a, that's a really important point in this because I totally understand I have, I've been there a lot right, in my life, and I have had to see how, wow, my standards of judgment are not the Lord's standards of judgment. And what that did was it made it hard, it made it hard for me to receive God's correction, God's discipline, because it sounds like rejection, right? But you'll notice that for me, I now preach a lot of this stuff. I try and preach the goodness and the mercy and the kindness of God, and I try and preach the warnings, right? The warnings um, and, the, and, the, and the proclamation of judgment. Why? Because that's, that's what all the biblical examples did, and that's what God does throughout the scriptures. Okay. Very good, very good point. Thanks for bringing that up, Joanna. It's really important. Why else? We're just going to take a little bit of time, a little bit more time on this, and we'll be done. Why else are we intimidated? Yes, that's a great point. That's a great point, okay? We in the church, and this is I'm including myself in here, we've done a poor job equipping you guys, right, apologetically, right? Meaning how do you defend the faith not using the Bible, right? Because we teach you, we always appeal to Scripture. Right? This is what the Scripture says. That's why you should obey it, right? But we have to give you more than just the Bible says so. Right? If all we give you is the Bible says so, then you have no ability to talk with non-Christians in a compelling manner. Right? And that's really why guys like Ben Shapiro um, are so influential and so important right now because he's able to make arguments without appealing to the authority of Scripture. Right? And that's why I highly recommend that you guys all listen to him. 
Okay, he's great at this, but this is really what all pastors need to do. We need to not just tell you sex outside of marriage is evil. Okay, if that's all we tell you, you're not going to have power, number one, to do it, <laughs> and you're not going to have power to convince anybody else, right? We have to explain to you why it's evil, right? Why it's forbidden. And if we can do that effectively for you, then you'll have power to obey it, and you'll be able to give a convincing argument to those around you. Does that make sense? Okay, that's a very, very important point. Okay, that's why I, I would highly recommend Shapiro. Are there any others? Dennis Prager is also very good at this. Okay, Give, giving rationale for the commands of God. Okay, why they logically make sense. Well, I think it's a related point. We're just confused. A lot of Christians are just confused about what's right and wrong. Right? We just don't know. Again, there's so many Christian leaders teaching different things. Right? You go to a different church. You'll, you know, you'll hear another pastor saying, oh, yeah, what that pastor says is wrong. And here I am saying that, you know, some of these other pastors are teaching things that are wrong. Right? There's so much confusion as to what is actually true. Right? This is a huge stumbling block in the body right now. Right? So what I, what I want to, you know, try and give you guys is a rubric to understand what Christian unity is all about. Okay? Christian unity is not compromise on everything. Okay? Christian unity is really having humility but in humility, it's standing on the truth together. And so what I think you'll find is that many serious Christian leaders agree on most of the, the, the emphases and the, the important points of Christianity. We're all going to disagree on things like minor doctrine, you know, like Calvinism and, you know, I don't know, things like that, right? Those are really not as important. So don't worry too much about that kind of stuff, okay? But I think we all pretty much agree on some of these essentials, right? Which is, you know, the scriptures, prayer, evangelism, right? Um, it And if they have a heart for those things, then they're, it's all good, okay? Now, I will warn you, and I already have warned you, those Christian teachers that teach that, you know, you don't, you can practice sin and still be saved, okay? These, this is, this is modern day heresy, okay? This is actually not modern day heresy. This is ancient heresy, okay? This is what the entire book of Jude is about, okay? The entire book of Jude is is warning against leaders in the church who teach that you know grace is a license for sin, right? You can still sin, and God's grace covers over you. That is an ancient heresy, right? That the Bible itself warns about. Okay, so those that teach today that sexual immorality, no problem, you can practice that, and God's grace covers you, they're lying to you. Okay, these are false teachers in the body. Okay, now I don't know any national teachers that you know that teach that. I guess because I don't listen to <laughs> the false teachers. But, you know, most great, well-respected teachers in the body are going to warn you about things like that. Okay? Make sense? So confusion is one thing, because you're going to get a lot of that, especially on the college campuses. Um, and, then the, and then the other thing is, um, is just a spirit of apathy. Right? Just a, um, we don't recognize how important our role is in all of this. And a lot of that is a subtle, I think, misunderstanding of God's sovereignty like, well, God's will is going to happen no matter what, and I can't really change anything. I want to I want to say, I think that this that's a wrong mentality. I think we have an incredible impact on the destiny of our nation. Our actions will impact maybe thousands, potentially millions of lives. Okay, I think our lives can directly impact those things. Okay, Now, I understand that there is teaching in the body that says that that's not the case. That's part of the problem here. <laughs> I would lovely just submit to you that I think Scripture is pretty clear on this. Okay, we do our actions do matter, and we have the ability to really affect other people. Okay, all right. Okay, let me just do one more discussion question, and then we'll finish up here. Okay. How can Christians in various industries glorify important kingdom truths, such as in movies, music, education, politics? What should you do? If you're a Christian filmmaker, how do you glorify the kingdom? And for the sake of time, I'm sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, okay? I'm gonna make an argument here. Okay, now I could be wrong on this. I actually don't like a lot of Christian films. Okay. A lot of Christian films, I think, are just way too explicit, okay, about um about the gospel of salvation. Right? They've and, and it's very stale. And I would argue that's because it's really not that compelling. 
the gospel of salvation. And I tried to clarify today what the biblical gospel actually is, right? It's a, it's a gospel about a perfect restored creation, right? Because Jesus has been appointed high king of everything, right? There are, there are ways we can present that truth in a way that is extremely compelling, right? And I think that's what we should be focusing on as Christian um, filmmakers, okay? I pitched an idea for a TV show that I'm still waiting for someone to do. I pitched it to a number of people, right, at this point. This is what I think we should do, okay? TV show, all right? It's called What's Wrong With Me? Every week, you know, you take an issue that people struggle with, normal people struggle with, right? So let's say um, procrastination or something like that. that that's, that's too weak. Let's say um, an eating disorder, okay? It's like, let's say, an eating disorder. And what we'll do is we'll find um, some ministers in the nation that really have strong anointing in this area, have real authority here, okay? And we'll interview them. Why do people struggle with eating disorders, okay? And then we'll take a couple or some people to go through ministry with this person. We'll film the whole thing, right? As they go through ministry, right, as they get freedom, their testimonies and everything, and then we'll, and then we'll share, and that's an episode. What's wrong with me? Eating disorder. I think that would be compelling television. Why? Because that's far more effective than than a sermon. I think a filmmaker who does that show, which is a cheap show, by the way, you can do that show for relatively cheap, right? They can find they can find a Christian and a non Christian audience that would you could lead people into real freedom in those areas, right? And you're preaching, you're you're teaching biblical things without being, you know, preachy in the sense that, like, hey, you have to believe this. No, you're just saying, look, th this is how all these people got free, right, through this message and through these, this, these practices. It tells their story. I think that'd be compelling, right? That's a great idea for a TV show, right? I remember I played a game some years ago, um, Bioshock. Any of you guys ever played Bioshock? I forget which one. I think it was the last one. But he, like, goes up into the clouds, and it's like the city up in the clouds, right? I'm playing this game where they present this city up in the clouds and it, there's clear heavenly themes to the city, right? I'm, pl I'm playing this game. I'm like, I freaking hate, I hate, I hate this, right? They are doing a more compelling vision of heaven, right? Than like all the Christian media combined, right? In this, in this random throwaway game and it's all fake, right? They're, they're, they, they go on to show how like they're a bunch of hypocrites and so of course the Christians are hypocrites again, right? That's always how it is in all media, right? The Christians are actually total hypocrites and they, you know, are terrible people. And they're using some of the most compelling themes that we have and they're using it to preach humanism through this game. And we are teaching people on Sundays that they can go to heaven and sing forever on a cloud. And everyone's like, yay. <laughs> and it makes me mad. Because I'm like, man, we should be able to, we should be able to give glimpses of the age to come in a way that would fill every single person with great longing, right? Like, I, I want that. I would love to be part of that world, right? The sad thing is that Hollywood is doing that far better than we're doing that right now. But they're using those things to preach a humanistic message. It's always a humanistic message, okay? It's always a humanistic message. And they're doing it. And now, what do we have? We have Christians who can't stop watching humanistic media because it's so good, because it's so creative. And we have Christian media that we were like, well, it would be good for us to watch, but it's so boring and terrible that nobody wants to watch it. Like, it drives me crazy, right? Like, this drives me crazy, right? Come on, Christian filmmakers. Make some compelling, creative material that glorifies real truth. Like, we should have the greatest movies. Why? Because we believe it's all real. There's a real spiritual battle happening all around us. Give us a glimpse into it for God's sakes, right? Like, there's so much. I, I think about this stuff all the time, right? But why? Why can't we get it? Because we have so much religiousness in the church, right? We have so much religiousness. It drives me crazy. Lord, give us Christian filmmakers who are awesome. Okay, that's some of my ideas, okay? What are some of your guys' ideas? How can we see Christians be influential and effective in the world? Yes. It is, is in terrible, media is in terrible shape right now. Okay, journalism is in terrible shape. 
there, you guys hear about the freedom marches that were happening? Um, it was either last year or the year before up in NorCal. Okay, freedom marches. They were, they were marching for free speech. Why? Because you guys remember when Ben Shapiro tried to speak at Berkeley? Like they had a riot and all this kind of stuff and Minneapolis and all this kind of stuff. So they started organizing these freedom marches to stand for free speech because free speech is under attack on all these university campuses. And you know what happened? They got labeled as alt-right white supremacists. All the Bay Area newspapers called them white supremacist rallies. And so what happened? You had the entire Antifa crowd come out, right? And they were attacking them and because the newspapers were lying about it. San Francisco Chronicle was outright lying about it. People called in and told them this is not a white supremacist rally, right? A lot of the leaders of these freedom marches were Christians, right? A lot of them were Christians, but they were being labeled as alt-right white supremacists, okay? And the media was straight up lying, and it got all of them attacked, right? All of them got attacked at these rallies. Th this is the state of journalism today. They're straight up lying, these, these fake lying hypocrite journalists, okay? And yes, we need real journalists. So, Sylvia, this is what I'm saying. It is in my heart to do pro-life rallies. I don't know if we're going to do them this year, maybe next year, maybe the year after, but I feel like God is building in our hearts. I think what we should do is we we do the journalism. We'll invite, we'll invite um, some conservative media to be part of it, but we should do our own journalism. We should record it. We should take pictures. We should write articles, and we should try and get the word out from our perspective. Because the reality is that it, it, any any national media that see it, any campus media, they will just smear us like crazy, right? They'll call us white supremacists, right? We're a bunch of Koreans out there, right? They'll be like these white supremacist Koreans, you know, like like th they're just freaking liars. And especially these campus newspapers, right? They're the freak, they're okay. The Daily Cal, the Berkeley newspaper, wrote an article defending Antifa about how Antifa was standing for what's right. These freaking liars at the Daily Cal, right? When that girl, um, when that girl, um, what was her name? Chow. Yes, yeah, something Chow. Isabel Chow, right? When she, when she abstained, she didn't even vote against it, right? Okay, this was a student senate bill just saying, is a token bill saying that we affirm the rights of LGBT, transgender people, and we love them essentially, right? And she was just saying, Look, I love transgender people, but I cannot affirm right a lifestyle that I don't agree with. And I abstain from my vote. She just abstained. She didn't even vote against it, right? And she got freaking slammed. The Daily Cal wrote an article about how she's like a, a hater and how all the church and the pastors and the region are haters and all this kind of stuff. And they're defending all this stuff. And that's going out from our newspapers right now, right? They're actively lying to us. And as Christians, that's what I'm saying. We can't just be like, oh man, it's so sad, right? It's so sad. No, we have to fight against it, right? We have to do our own counter protest, not coming in the same spirit that they're coming in, right? Not in the spirit of offense or hate, but in the spirit of righteous anger. That's the spirit in which we should be moving, right? And righteous anger and being clear about it. These newspapers are lying to you, right? They're lying about this. These people have no integrity, no honesty. They're just trying to brainwash these kids. And that's what's happening. This idea that a Christian senator can't say I'm a Christian and believe in biblical morality. Now all of a sudden I'm a hater. You, you understand what they're talking about? They're talking about literally more than half the world are racist, bigot, homophobes at the point, right? Because you're talking about every Muslim on the planet, which by the way, they would never, ever condemn a Muslim senator who said anything like that, right? They would never do that. And they're condemning every Jew and every biblical Christian in the earth, right? And they're saying they're all racist, bigot, homophobes and all this kind of stuff. This is, and nobody will stand against them and say, these guys are freaking liars, right? We should have had a Christian march. I called all the pastors, not all the pastors, I called a bunch of pastors in Berkeley, right? And I said, you need to show public support for what she's doing. You need to stand and give a public statement and say that we agree with this and we will not be bullied or intimidated. And to their credit, a number of the pastors said, I'm willing to do that. Some of them were not willing, <laughs> okay? But these are the times that we live in. We have to engage with the culture. We have to start fighting it. Okay, so that's a very good one. Yes, we need Christian journalists, okay, who'd stand for integrity. And guess what? You can't work at the New York Times and the Washington Post that way. This is not going to be possible. That's why you have to be surrendered in this area. Okay, you are not going to be able to get the positions of great prestige and influence, okay, if you're going to stand for truth. It will cost you something. 
It will cost you. You'll have a lower salary, right? You might have to fight to get work, okay? But ultimately, this is the test. Is our confidence in that God will provide for us? Or is it that, you know, we've got to do whatever we can to get promoted in this world? I, I personally, I would always err on the side of, I want to be clear about what my honest beliefs are, even if it costs me something, okay? Absolutely, okay, absolutely. Christian journalists, Lord, give them to us, please, in Jesus' name. What else? Just a couple more and we'll be done. How about Christian schools? Christian schools. Now, let me be clear here, because a lot of Christian schools are not that great. Okay, a lot of Christian schools are not that great. Okay, I'm not saying that we have to have a school. How about very dynamic schools? Okay, very dynamic schools, meaning this. I think college these days is largely a waste of money. Sorry, college students. <laughs> okay, not totally a waste of money. It's just way more expensive than it needs to be for the marketable skills that you're getting and stuff like that, right? I think we can design, you know, K through 12 education and maybe even um, higher education, right? That is a much better education in terms of giving you marketable skills and teaching you a biblical worldview, right? In a way that's much more compelling and um, trains you to succeed in the world far better than, than the schools are that are out there these days. The problem is it's so politicized. Okay, we need school choice because what happens is you get barred from having uh, any of the government's money Okay, if you try and do something like that. And then you have to do a private school, and private schools are prohibitively expensive compared to free. right? So what we need to do is vote in school choice. You guys know what school choice is? Okay, Okay, you guys need to know this stuff. Okay, You need to know school choice. Why? Because if we don't vote for school choice, ain't nobody voting for it. Okay, School choice is initiative... All right, uh, President Trump's Secretary of Education is a woman named Betsy DeVos. Have you guys heard of Betsy DeVos? She's one of the most smeared, slandered people in Trump's cabinet. Do you know why? Because she's fighting for school choice. That's why. Okay, She's fighting for school choice. F why? For us. That's why she's fighting for school choice. Because school choice, what it does is it, it takes all the government's money for education and it turns it into vouchers. So every kid gets a voucher that they can use at the school of their choice. What it does is it, it destroys the monopoly of government-controlled education. And the Democrats hate that. Why? Because so much of their funding comes from teachers' unions. You have to understand, there's an unholy alliance of the teachers' unions. The teachers' unions support the Democratic Party. Democratic Party, Party supports the teachers' unions. That's how this works. Okay? It's the most corrupt thing. By the way, labor unions, it's the same thing. It's so corrupt. right? The labor unions negotiate with you know the politician who gets his money from the labor union. You know, it's like so corrupt, right? But this is the system of politics that we have. So that's why we have to fight in these areas. We have to fight for school choice so that we can make schools that are great. I think we can make better schools than the schools that are out there now. I think we can. And I think that in this next generation, I think we will. I think we're gonna make better schools than the schools they have. Look, okay, I'm gonna go too long if I get it just down the stream. I think some of you guys should, should seriously consider creating schools. And when we that, how many of you guys feel called to education? Feel like you're gonna work as a teacher or something like that? Okay, here's what you do. Go work at a school. Get the skills that you need, okay? But in the future, consider starting or being part of a new school that would really bring a dynamic shift to education, okay? Um, in, in South Carolina, Morningstar, it's a church I, I highly respect, they started their own school over there. They have a no homework policy, zero homework at that school, okay? And one day is a job shadow day, so you're not even doing classroom instruction, okay? Their students scored higher than students from any other school in their three-state region. I think we can do the same thing, right? I think we can change the system. You have to understand, public education today is terrible. Okay, K through 12 education is absolutely terrible. It is, the vision is babysitting, okay? The vision is not to educate great in a, a great way. The vision is to babysit and to leave no student behind. Okay, that's the vision. If we create dynamic schools, we can create schools that educate kids way better than what we have today. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm on, I'm, should I get off my soapbox now? All right, hopping off the soapbox. All right, with that, um, it is 10 o'clock. We started at, what, 8? Can you look at, look at the... Um,
Okay, our next thing's at 10. Perfect. All right, you guys have a 10 minute break. Okay, 10 minute break. Use the restroom, chat. We have snacks in the back for you. Our next section is going to be um, resume building. How many guys have a resume already? Okay, were you told to bring it? Did you bring laptops? Okay, okay, and you have it on your laptops, right? I'm assuming, perfect. Good, 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 yes. All right, 10 minutes, and then 10 minutes, come back, have your laptops out, ready to go.